Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to uh, Life Church. It's lovely to be able to speak to you this morning. I feel like I'm pretty boomy at the moment, but I'm sure it'll be rectified. Um, wonderful to be able to welcome you this morning, and uh, I have the privilege this morning of opening God's Word to us. And so if you want to join me, we're at uh, page 661 in these big black Bibles. If there's one near enough for you to grab one, uh, they tend to be scattered around. So page 661, we've reached Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I hope you're enjoying our journey through this very unusual book. Uh, if any of you are new to us or comparatively new to us, uh, you may not be necessarily familiar with this book. It's a pretty unusual one as far as the Bible goes. It's one in which uh, an experiment is kind of documented retrospectively. A guy goes on a journey of discovery and explores kind of everything that life has to offer, uh, including all kinds of bad things. He, he really journeys into all these different avenues that life offers us, and, uh, and then he, he feeds back on his uh, exploration from a position of repentance, having recognized that there was nothing to be gained by throwing himself into all of these various ventures without reference to God. So it's a full exploration of everything that life offers to us under the sun. Under the sun is the repeated refrain that comes through the book again and again, and it's the idea of what it's like to live without reference to the God who is beyond the sun, as it were. What is life like without God in the picture? Okay, and so we're going to see in chapter 9 this morning, he's got some very interesting things to tell us. And I'm calling the message this morning, Fully Alive, Fully Alive, which might surprise you when you see the heading for chapter 9. Death comes to all. Yeah, the irony is not lost on me, uh, but the, the, uh, this, this morning's message is called Fully Alive Regardless. So the point is this, he's going to go through a series of things here, he's going to show us uh, a series of pretty sober realities, and he is in the midst of them, he's going to put forward to us one glorious hope, okay? So we're going to see kind of seven sobering realities, one of them in the middle is going to be full of joy, and at the end we're going to find out how do we get in on the joy in the middle one, okay? If that makes sense, I trust it does. So... You might forgive me for beginning by quoting William Wallace in what has to be my favorite film, Braveheart. Forgive me, I'm, I'm that sort of age where that's, that's the thing. And uh, I, anyone resonate with that? Yeah, no, no? okay. Um, I, I loved it, okay? So if you're not familiar with it, it's, uh, it tells the story of a young Scottish warrior who fought against England for independence. And uh, it is historically has some vague overlaps with what actually happened here and there. But essentially, it's just a good film. And uh, what happens at one point is that he is captured by his enemies. Uh, and an ally begs with him to plead for mercy from them because she's convinced that they are going to take his life. And uh, she says, please, please, you've got to ask for mercy. She says, you will die. It will be awful. And he responds with these quite awesome words, really. He says, Every man dies. Not every man really lives. And uh, in a sense, that's the message of these, these verses in Ecclesiastes. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. What is it like to really live? What does being fully alive look like? What does it mean for us to actually live fully, wholeheartedly? Jesus famously said, the enemy, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life in all its fullness. I wonder if you realize that's what Jesus' agenda is, to bring us into fullness of life. He didn't say, I have come to make them good. He didn't say, I have come to teach them how to, be, you know, to stop being naughty. He didn't say, I have come to clean them up. They're a grubby lot. No, I have come that they may have life in all its fullness. Full life, fully alive. That's what Jesus came to give us, abundant life. But where do we find such life? How do we find such life? It might seem surprising to ask such questions of a book like Ecclesiastes, but this is actually exactly what's being brought to the surface in Ecclesiastes, where true life is found and where it's not. So we're going to see a series of things where it's not found, and we're going to see where it is, with the central one offering us great hope and the final one showing us how, as I said, to access that hope. So let's pray, shall we, before we jump on in. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are, for your amazing kindness to us. 
and that you sent your son to rescue us from sin and death and shame and to bring us into fullness of life. And we thank you, you didn't only send your son and then give instructions, but you sent your spirit, that you are with us by your Holy Spirit now. And we just honor your presence and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We're so glad you're here in this place. We pray, please help us to understand the truth of your word in a way that will completely revolutionize our lives, that will change us deeply from the heart. I pray, Lord, for some to go out of this place. I pray for all of us to go out of this place different from how we came in. I pray that maybe for some in this place, it might be the first time they get to discover this endless life that you have come to bring. Let us stumble into all your glory together. Let us find the joy of the wonders of knowing Jesus. So Holy Spirit, I pray, please let your light flood our hearts. Let it shine upon the page, as it were. Open these scriptures to us. Open our hearts to the scriptures. Make Jesus known to us. Strengthen us with your truth. Bring your, your presence deep into us. Make your glory known to us. I pray for each one to hear everything you want them to hear. I pray help me to say what you once said. Lord, rest upon us and be glorified in this time. We ask in Jesus' name. Just encourage you to take a moment to ask God to speak to you this morning, regardless of where you presently stand. You just invite God to speak to you. Do your best to open your heart to him. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, let's begin with verse 1. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears as he who shuns an oath. Now, we may be surprised to read some of these things, particularly if you're new to faith at all, because when you begin to realize what he's saying, it seems to directly contradict what most people think this is all about. People often assume that we come to a place like this to be taught about how to please God, how to live a moral life, how to kind of be good people. And actually, what he's showing us straight away here is what I'm calling the impotence of morality. Okay, that's the first point, the impotence of morality. He's actually showing us that trying to be good is completely pointless. Trying to be a moral person is going to accomplish nothing. That's quite surprising. You would tend to think, well, hang on a minute, I thought that's what we do. We go to church to learn to be good, don't we? To learn to be moral. He's saying, actually, if you put your hope in trying to be good, you'll find it's kind of, it will amount to nothing. He shows here there's no guarantee under the sun whether living morally or immorally makes any difference to your ultimate destiny. That's what he seems to be saying here. It's the same for all. The same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked. So you have Buddha who lives this life of extraordinary devotion seeking some sort of, I don't know, ultimate devotion to that which is true, as it were. And then you have Hitler who kind of lives in essentially the complete polar opposite. And what the writer is saying is, under the sun, looking at both lives, they both end up in the ground. Ultimately, there's no kind of, you know, we can't say we know that this one goes to a better place than this one. We don't know. Without God breaking through with revelation, our efforts to live morally are not going to lead to any kind of ultimate deliverance. You understand? Being moral is not the answer. It may surprise you to hear that. I thought, well, hang on a minute, isn't that supposed to be really important to be good? Well, yeah, in a sense it is. But to use that as a way of trying to secure some hope for the future is about as hopeless, as Spurgeon famously said, as trying to climb to the moon on a rope of sand. You try and reach heaven by your good deeds, it's like trying to cross the Atlantic on a paper boat. You try and invest in your own moral efforts, you'll get nowhere. There's no guarantee of a better afterlife if we try to be good people. And that's what he seems to be saying here. There's nothing to suggest in the Bible that our righteous deeds will guarantee eternal life. 
And actually, that's what every other religious system essentially suggests. You do good stuff, it will equal good results for you ultimately. And that's why there's no assurance in any other religious system. There's no guarantee of eternal life in Islam. No guarantee of it, because you're hoping desperately that your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad deeds. Even Muhammad didn't have any kind of guarantee he was going to get into uh, paradise. No guarantee of it. You just don't know. You're hoping. Similarly, in Jehovah's Witness, uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, faith, it's still investing in, your, in yourself, in your own efforts. You look across whichever religious system you, you look at. It's always, what can I do? What can I do? Am I doing enough? And so people die with huge questions as to whether or not they've done enough to be accepted. And this is what he's pointing to. We just don't know in this life. The Bible never says that being religious or moral will save us. In fact, the surprising thing is that Jesus seemed to have the biggest problem with the most religious people. Those who kind of invested heavily in their own moral performance were the ones he had the biggest difficulty with. They were the ones who, who proved almost kind of impervious to his grace and his mercy and his message because they're so invested in themselves. Our investing in our own morality will never accomplish deliverance for us. And so the first thing we see is the impotence of morality. Religion gets us nowhere. Morality gets us nowhere. Those who invest in it most deeply end up often most desperate. You look at the man like Martin Luther. 500 years ago, he saw the world transform. But before he discovered the gospel that blew his mind, he was completely invested in his own morality. And so he pushed himself to near death by endless fastings, sleeping without a blanket in the cold of winter, trying desperately to show God how serious he was, with no assurance whatsoever that there was any acceptance from God of all his efforts. Living just as a moral person and investing in that as your hope is a fruitless endeavor. You may be surprised to hear that in a church, but really it shouldn't surprise us. Jesus didn't come saying, try and be good enough, praise God. So we see the emptiness of religion, the impotence of morality. And he says, he acknowledges in verse 3, this is an evil in all that's done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. It seems tragic that someone who tries to live a good life and someone who just throws themselves into all kinds of sin, that there's no, we don't know what happens to them all. It's kind of like, who knows looking at that? He says it's an evil. We don't know that the, the righteous and the wicked, they both end up in the grave. It's, it's tragic that this is how it is. So that brings us to our second point, which is the insanity of sin. Because you may think, okay, well, if morality is so impotent, then I guess <laughs> we could just go ahead and sin then. Yeah, if, if being good isn't the solution, well, is being bad it then? Well, no. <laughs> being bad is not going to help us anymore. Picking up on the second half of verse 3, also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So he's just said, you know, these people try to be good. There's no guarantees it's going to get them anywhere. But let's face it, most people don't necessarily try to do that fully. And there is this sin that's common to us all. In fact, he makes this pretty devastating statement. The hearts of the children of man are full of evil. I wonder how that sits with you this morning. Is that a, a, a pronouncement over humanity that you recognize? You think, okay, the, uh, the hearts of humanity, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil. Well, Jesus affirmed exactly the same thing. He said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? It's interesting, he's talking to his followers. He's got totally comfortable referring to them as evil. <laughs> if you, being evil, just chucks that in there, you being evil as you are, and all that, oh, yeah, I suppose, suppose we are. The Bible repeatedly affirms this. They're not just jaded, bitter, distorted words. This is what God tells us in his word time and again. We are born in sin and live in sin. And there's no one who does good, not even one, it says in Psalm 14. In Psalm 53, it says the same thing. Romans 3.23 famously says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, we are all sinners. Every single one of us. We all fail, we all stumble, we all make mistakes, we all rebel, we all do things we should never do. We are all sinners. And the Bible is unequivocal about that. It, it, you know, I, I heard someone you know, well-meaningly try to say, oh, Jesus doesn't mean it when he says, you know, you being evil. Jesus doesn't say things he doesn't mean. <laughs> he says things he means. We are evil. In comparison with God, 
we are indefensibly human. And the sooner you get your head around that, the quicker there's going to be some hope. It's one thing, no, 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 I'm good. You think, well, uh, no, acknowledge that you're not. If everyone could see on the screen behind me all the worst thoughts you've ever had, all the worst deeds you've ever done, all the worst things you've ever said, if it all came up there, if that was me, I'd be out of the door before the second image came up. I just you think, I, that's all of us, we all behave indefensibly. So don't defend it. And the, the Bible, we, give, we get hope from God when we accept what he says. First thing is to acknowledge, yeah, we're sinful. And so we see the insanity of sin. It's interesting, it says, full of evil and madness is in their hearts. Sin is a kind of madness, really. Evil and madness go together. There is a kind of insanity in sin. You see it quite beautifully in the story of Nebuchadnezzar, who becomes this extraordinary ruler. He rules over Babylon. He's got this incredible kingdom. And one day he's striding around on the top of his kind of palace, uh, the, the balcony area, and he's kind of beholding his kingdom, and he's kind of congratulating himself about how wonderful and glorious he is. When God sort of says, okay, I think that's enough of your extraordinary arrogance and pride, and he suddenly, he just kind of, he loses his mind. And for seven years, he behaves like an animal. And his nails grow long like claws and his hair grows out. And he just behaves like a beast. And he goes out like eating grass. I mean, he just loses his mind. And then he says, and then I looked up to the heavens and my reason returned to me. When I recognized, oh, God is God, I'm not. When I thought I was, it sent me mad. When I realized I'm not and that he is, it restored sanity to me. Sin has a kind of insanity in the very mixture of it. That we think we can lie and somehow get away with it and remain sort of somehow trustworthy. That we think that we can steal or we think that we can, whatever it is, behave in a lustful or evil way, whatever way it is. There's always a total unreasonableness at the very heart of sin. That's what sin is. It's just sheer unreasonableness. God made us and he knows how to, how to lead us and how to help us to live. And when we disregard his truth, we step into total foolishness. And the more engrossed in sin you become, the looser your grip on sanity will be. Morality may be impotent, but sin is insane. Sin is stupid. Evil actions betray the person doing them. So we see evil, that leads to madness. And then he says that death ends up with the result. After that, they go to the dead. So we have sin that it, it kind of corrupts us, it, it maddens us, and ultimately it's taking us to destruction. I've had to pray about things this last week, areas where I find myself tempted, where my mind wanders. And I'm saying, Father, please help me see the deception in this. I know I'm being deceived when I allow myself to think that way. It's very difficult to recognize that because it seems so alluring and appealing, this thing that I know is from Satan. I'm saying, God, help me see the deception in it. Because it looks attractive. It looks kind of like pleasant and good. And you think, no, that's sin. God, help me see the deception in it. Help me recognize, like we said recently, the, the hook in the worm that, I, that the fish goes after. Help me see what actually is going on here. Yeah, it's dangerous. It leads to death, the insanity of sin. So we've seen the impotence of morality. Secondly, the insanity of sin. Thirdly, we see the inevitability of death. Time and again, the writer of Ecclesiastes brings this to the fore. Yeah, we're going to die. And you think, well, cheer, you know, cheers. <laughs> Doesn't seem particularly wonderful to hear it, but actually it's profoundly helpful. Verse 4, but he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. So as long as there's life, there may yet be hope that there's none beyond the grave without God in the picture. For the living, verse 5, know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So he's saying that the living know that they will die. So they're in a position of knowledge. So he's saying it's better to be alive, better to be a, a living dog. Now, in the Jewish mind, dogs is like, you know, we're not thinking like, yay, we love our little dogs and, you know, whatever dog food we get excited about and all the kind of, we're very friendly about our dogs. Not in Jewish culture. Dogs were just mangy, horrible creatures that no one liked. Okay, there's no affection for dogs whatsoever in Jewish culture, particularly at this time. Okay, so to any kind of reference to dog is, is bad. But better to be a living dog than a dead lion. I mean, wow, lions, glorious, majestic, beautiful. Yeah, but if it's dead, it's better to be a living dog. So life is better than death. You know, we have a, we have a position of knowledge. We know. So what, what, what do we know? Well, it says that the living know that they will die. <laughs> it's like, well, great. 
what wonderful knowledge I have. You know, you walk through the graveyard, you think, ah, I know more than you, know more than you, know more. Well, what do you know? That, that I'm going to be in there. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not, it's not, he's not boasting about this great thing, but he's saying life is better than death, and yet death is what's coming. So verse 6, the love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that's done under the sun. So love and hate, all these passions that we may live with, well, death snuffs them out, as it were, as it were. And we're all heading this way towards the grave, where from this position of under the sun without God in the picture, there's no more share in what God does on the, on the world. And so it's this kind of be confronted with the reality. Trying to live a moral life, no answers there. Throwing yourself into sin, utter insanity. Death is what awaits. Imagine you might be hoping that this, this good news is good after all of that. Well, here we come. We go to the fourth point here, the invitation of joy, the invitation of joy. So he says beautifully in verse 7, Go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you're going. So it's an awesome, sudden burst of color into what's otherwise a pretty drab picture. And it's amazing to see that here that God doesn't merely permit us to do these joyful things. He instructs us to. He commands us to. Okay, he, he tells us to go. We are to, we are to do these things. In fact, he doesn't only instruct us to do it, he instructs us to do it with all our might. So he says, it's amazing to go eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Look at the imperatives here. Go, eat, drink with a merry heart. Let your garments be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy, do it, do it with all your might. These are good words. This is what God then brings into this picture that otherwise seems so drab. This amazing uh, invitation into the delights of life. Now, different people interpret this section differently. Some people say, oh, this is kind of just a cynical kind of, oh, go on, you might as well just, because, you know, life's all pointless. Some people read Ecclesiastes that way. I don't really think that's the point that he's making. I think that actually he's saying that, yes, life is full of all kinds of confusing aspects and we don't have all of the answers, but for those who know the Lord, there's much to rejoice in. Actually, we get to enjoy God's creation. And we're invited to, and we're commanded to. Now, if you're not convinced that I'm interpreting Ecclesiastes rightly, then, well, it's in other bits of the Bible too, which are less confusing. <laughs> okay, so Psalm 104 beautifully says, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock, plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So, okay, so if you're thinking, oh, does it really mean that? Well, it definitely means it there. <laughs> the Bible, God invites us to fully embrace and enjoy the gifts that he gives us in, in, in a happy heart, and to rejoice in those provisions. And actually to recognize he gives them to us without nervousness. He's, he's not thinking, oh, I have a little bit of no, no, no. He's generous. I mean, we all know, yeah, Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding where they had run out of wine. Then, you know, it's kind of like they probably drank quite a lot and he's making more wine. He is overwhelmingly generous. He, he, he doesn't seem to be quite so sort of, you know, fussy and troubled as we can sometimes be about enjoying his gifts to us. You know, when he feeds the 5,000, there's 12 basketfuls left over at the end. He just overflows with provision. And he's inviting us to enjoy these things. Wine is included here. And some people say, oh, okay, oh Christians shouldn't drink wine. Oh, Jesus did, it seems. And as I say, turned water into wine at a wedding. So it's difficult to defend that position. <laughs> You know, by all means, if, if, if we have personal difficulties with it, it would, there's, you know, we want to be sensible, and no one's forced. But Jesus is unapologetic in giving wonderful things to us and inviting us to enjoy them. 
And we tend to think that holiness is a kind of, mm, uh, rather not. We say, no, no, that's not what Jesus looked like. Jesus looked like a man fully alive who got accused of being a drunkard and a, and a, and a glutton because he's always eating and drinking with people. He's always in the midst of the party, it seems. He seems to be an appetite for enjoying the good things of God. I mean, what it must have been to be around him celebrating the goodness of God without any kind of sin in that, rejoicing in the provisions of God. That's a wonderful, holy thing to enjoy what God gives to us with a happy and grateful heart, to think, I'm going to enjoy this glass of wine. I'm going to enjoy this meal. I'm going to enjoy being with my wife. I'm going to enjoy the the delights of sexual love in marriage. God made these things. It's so tragic that the world has managed to twist Christianity and you get this view of it where people say, oh, you mustn't. It's terribly evil. You know, priests mustn't marry because it's all dreadfully evil. I think that the Bible itself says that that's demonic. It actually says that in the Bible. But there will be those who teach that the men of God shouldn't marry. It says that. It says that will be, that will be a, that's a wrong thing. Wrong. Wrong. We should be able to enjoy these things. God gave them to us. Again, if you, don't, if you don't believe me, Song of Solomon. I mean, good night. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's all there. It says, in terms of the enjoyment of this marital love, in chapter 5, verse 1, those who have been enjoying one another are encouraged with the following instruction. Eat, friends, drink, and drink deeply, lovers. Now, it's talking about their enjoyment of one another. It's drink of love. Another translation says, eat, friends, and drink. Drink your fill of love. Or another translation, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. It's glorious. When Adam and Eve were made, it says that they were naked and unashamed. God did that. God did that. He invented that. He made that. It's amazing. This is what God gives to us. These beautiful pleasures of life. And holiness says, thank you, and embraces what God gives as the gift. Now, there are parameters. It's within marriage. I'm not just saying just go out there. It's within marriage, between a man and a woman. Very clear. But once we're within the parameters that God assigns, rejoice. It's amazing. It's what God gives. Food, drink, the enjoyment of love. Listen to what David Gibson says in this fabulous book that Rob referred to recently called Destiny, going through the book of Ecclesiastes. He says this, It's vital to see that eating, drinking, dressing, and loving in these verses do not form an exhaustive list of God's gifts. Rather, it's a representative list of what it looks like to love life and live it to the full. These things are a way of saying, when God made the world, he made it good. And no amount of being a Christian, being spiritual, ever changes the fact that God put you in a physical world with hands and food and drink and culture and relationships and beauty. Sin fractures everything, distorts everything. It means we cannot understand everything. But sin does not uncreate everything. So if we were to tap into the teacher's worldview and train of thought, I think an expanded list would go something like this. Ride a bike. See the Grand Canyon. Go to the theater. Learn to make music. Visit the sick. Care for the dying. Cook a meal. Feed the hungry. Watch a film. Read a book. Laugh with some friends until it makes you cry. Play football. Run a marathon. Snorkel in the ocean. Listen to Mozart. Ring your parents. Write a letter. Play with your kids, spend money, learn a language, plant a church, start a school, speak about Christ, travel to somewhere you've never been, adopt a child, give away your fortune, and then some. Shape someone else's life by laying down your own. Fully alive. He's not embarrassed. He's not embarrassed by what he's given us. He's not embarrassed by blessing us with wonderful things. And he invites us to fully embrace them and enjoy them as gifts from heaven. The devil loves to try to distort this. Loves to try and make you feel guilty for things that God would have you enjoy. I mean, imagine if on Christmas morning, you know, there are the gifts being celebrated. The, and you imagine if you're a parent and you've got a child there to open up things, I think, but, but it's okay, am I allowed to? Well, you, what do you mean, are you allowed to? This is for you. I mean, imagine that. Imagine it's like, no, no, I won't open that. I won't open that. I'll leave that. I'll leave that one. I mustn't, should I? You think? This is for you. <laughs> this is what God gives to you. God wants us to enjoy his creation. He wants us to celebrate it and receive it with joy. Now, when you're persuaded of that, when you know he gives me meat and drink, he gives me these beautiful things, then you enjoy them with a happy heart in fellowship with him, and that keeps you in a good place. 
that's that fellowship with him where you know he smiles on this is what helps you when you think, you know what, I think I've probably had enough now. If, you, if it becomes a preoccupation where all you care about is the food, the drink, the sex, or whatever, if that becomes your idol, then of course joy goes down the plug hole. And he would keep you from that. But the way that the devil kind of tricks us is often to make you feel guilty for just the legitimate enjoyment. And what God wants us to understand is, no, these things are given to you as gifts. Embrace them happily in fellowship with me, knowing I smile on you, knowing that I'm with you. Because that means that as you, as you enjoy my gift, you're actually enjoying me. There's fellowship with God. There's love for God in this picture. Now, if we say, no, 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 I just want your gift, well, that's, that's a heart of sin. But if we are persuaded, you are a generous father, you give to me, and now it tastes good. And I enjoy it. Wonderful. Thank you, Father. That's filial, isn't it? Living in fellowship with God. I'm not sure if you're all persuaded yet. I think some of you are like, is this right? Stick with me, yeah? I believe it is. It's glorious. God is very generous to us. Now, just a small caveat to throw in. <laughs> Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that's your portion of life, and then your toil at which you toil under the sun. I heard someone say, he recognizes work. If you're married, you know that. If you don't already, you will. <laughs> it's work. Joy, but it's work. I don't mean to say, oh, these things are just an unmitigated delight. Yay! No, it's tough. It's hard. It's difficult. And so actually, to, to live in the enjoyment of these things, it's not always plain sailing. It can be quite difficult. And so if you find it hard, then that's all right. That's normal. Yeah? Okay? That's why it says do it with all your might. Employ your guts. Go for it. You know, work hard and uh, make your marriage better. Someone said, if the grass is greener on the other side, you're being tempted elsewhere, water your own grass. Yeah? Okay, fifthly, the imposition of chance. The next thing we see is another quite sobering thing. Again, verse 11, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise. So it's like the, the fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The, the strongest army doesn't always win the battle. The, 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 the bread, the resources don't always go to the wise or deserving. Riches don't always go to the intelligent. Favor doesn't always go to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. For man doesn't know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net and birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. So he seems to be saying that we're not on a level playing field. We are in a position, a situation, where there's no guarantee that just because you worked harder than others, you're going to get the thing. Just because you're faster, you're going to win the race. You never know when the injury is going to come. You never know when the sudden twist is going to get thrown in. There is this sense in which just chance and happenstance, just the way things turn out, can be pretty random. And sometimes we find ourselves snared in happenings, circumstances that you never would have anticipated. And he's just being honest about that. It can seem quite cruel when life just throws you a curveball. You think, whoa, I wasn't expecting that diagnosis. I wasn't expecting this sudden twist. I wasn't expecting this sudden turn. And it feels cruel when that happens. And really, I think that there's great comfort in some of the stories in the Bible when people seem to be most thrown around. I'm thinking of Job. I'm thinking of Joseph. I'm thinking about Paul. I'm thinking about Joseph ends up in prison for two extra years. He's already been in prison for a long time. And a guy who was supposed to tell the Pharaoh he doesn't belong there just forgets. That's all it is. Two years, I'm here because a guy forgot to say something. That's why I'm here. Because one man forgot to say something. That's what's determining my circumstances. No. A sovereign God is writing you into the pages of Scripture and history as one of the most beautiful examples of faith the world will ever know. So it looks like kind of flotsam and jetsam being thrown around, but actually it's God. This is the apple of God's eye. He is writing this story. Paul, again, thrown in prison. He's just like, oh, I spent two more years in prison, yeah? Think, what? And yet God is orchestrating events. Job, I mean, what happens if Job is desperate? God's the one who's there saying, have you considered my servant Job? Let's get to work. God is orchestrating this. When we feel most like we're lost, when it's most in the dark, Actually, Scripture suggests to me that those are the times when, if ever, God has his eye on you in such a particular way. When circumstances take that dark turn, that's when you know he's really, really watching. He's really with you. He's really sovereign over every little twist and turn. And he means to accomplish something wonderful in you in those moments. 
If I had to, if I, you know, if I could, if I had to do surgery on one of my children if they needed it. I mean, it's all well and good walking along the road with them and laughing and kicking a ball about. But if I had to do surgery, I'd be ever so, ever so, ever so particular, ever so attentive, ever so careful. God is watching you so carefully in these seasons when it just seems just baffling. No, no, no. He's particularly close. And then we see the impermanence, sixthly, the impermanence of legacy. Verse 13, I have seen, also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. So it's an incredible kind of zero to hero story. This poor man offers the wisdom that saves a whole community and then he's forgotten. <laughs> so again, if we'd be tempted to create a legacy, that's what I'm living for, he would say, well, no, that's not worth it. It doesn't last. Even a great hero, the legacy won't last. I saw a little picture of this as a teacher when I taught in a school for four years, and I had the privilege of being the only philosophy and ethics teacher in the school, so I taught all six classes in year seven, all six classes in year eight, all six classes in year nine, and I had already taught all of the six classes in year 10. It was a new school, there were only four years. And so when I left that school, I had taught nearly every single pupil in the school. I knew them virtually all, one or two kids who had special lessons who didn't come, but otherwise, virtually every kid in the school, I knew them. And when I would walk past the school, having left the school, he go, ah, oh, Mr. Margo, and all these guys. Of course, they're just so fond of me. And uh, you know, <laughs> you just see all, all these kids. You say, hey, it's so, so lovely to see them. I, I really love the kids I teach. I mean, you know, forgive me. But uh, I, you know, it's just like a fantastic bunch of kids. And you walk past, and you kind of feel like a little mini celebrity for kind of you know two and a half minutes. And it's like, Mr. Margo. I walk past the next year, and it's like, yeah, you know, slightly fewer faces I recognise. You know, it notches up a bit. And then the next year, oh, slightly fewer. And like, you know what? If I walk past that school now, it's like, who's that weird guy? Who's that weird guy? You know, it's, 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 the legacy has gone. <laughs> it was fun while it lasted. It doesn't last. We don't want to give ourselves to creating some sort of legacy. Okay. So we've seen the impotence of morality, the insanity of sin, the inevitability of death, the invitation of joy, the imposition of chance. It comes in a way that we don't want, as it were. And the impermanence of legacy. But finally, we come... Seventhly, to the importance of wisdom. Verse 17, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. He's showing us the crucial importance of wisdom and acknowledges the fact that wisdom is often quiet. Folly is loud. Wisdom is often calm and quiet and easily missed. It takes listening quietly, patiently, with the Bible open. Listening to someone who's got some years on you, humbly, benefiting from their experience. Wisdom is often quiet and easily missed. And to gain wisdom, there is a humility involved. There's a stooping to it. There's a coming under and saying, yeah, please tell me. I, I want to hear from you. There's that coming down in humility that is how we gain wisdom. Proverbs 1, 23 is a beautiful verse. It's wisdom speaking and says, if you turn at my reproof or my rebuke, as it's sometimes translated, if you turn, as in if you listen to me, behold, I'll pour out my spirit on you. I'll make my words known to you. But you have to be rebuked first. Coming to God, there will always be a sense in which, oh, you're right and I'm wrong. <laughs> it's glorious when you recognize it. And you think, oh, wow, you are right. And then there's the goodness that comes from that. But there's a humility that's required. There's a, some, a stooping and a coming near. And we live in a world full of destruction. Our key skill, most needed above all other skills perhaps, is listening. It's vital. We need to listen to him. And you know when you learn to listen to him, you know what he says? He says things like this. You are my son and I love you and I'm pleased with you. It's fabulous. You don't get that if you don't listen. I've gone years of my life without listening to that. And instead of listening to other stupid voices, and then you see the kind of rot that comes. If we listen, if we have the humility to say, Lord, please speak to me, he will tell of his love. He will sing of his love of us. 
He'll invite you into experiences of his love where you find yourself just sobbing. So you just think, how can you love me like this? I hope you've had moments like that. If you haven't, do ask God for them. Just this week, one of the, it's been a while since I've had a moment like that, but just, just last week, just praying, singing to God in, a, in one of the kids' rooms. <laughs> and just as I'm worshipping him, just suddenly you think, you really do actually love me. And you just, it's just awesome. Just the beauty of that. And your worries are just kind of go, all the fears, all the concerns, they kind of just dissolve into mush. It's just like, oh, this is all gone. He loves me. It's going to be all right. It's just beautiful. That's what you're invited into. So as we come to a close with this, I just want you to consider this. That Jesus was fully alive. He lived fully alive. Everywhere he went, he was fully alive. He engaged in the enjoyment of life such a wholesome way as someone said jesus literally ate his way through the gospels whenever you see jesus he's always going from a meal or to a meal he's just he's just he, he enjoys the life that god gives he enjoys the creation that god supplies but more than that he enjoys the awesome awareness i am his son whom he loves in whom he is well pleased and he drinks that in and that's what we're invited into the enjoyment of that Jesus, when he comes out of the baptismal waters, it's like God can't hold it back anymore. This is my son, and I love him, and I'm pleased with him. Jesus embraces all of that. Then he goes into the wilderness to face the devil, and the devil starts two out of three of his temptations by saying, if you're the son of God, and Jesus is thinking, I beg your pardon. I just heard him, didn't you? Everyone else did, saying, you are my son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was filled to the max with this assessment from heaven. And so he goes forward with that confidence that he is loved and delighted in. He lived under the favor, under the approval of God. Wherever Jesus went, he was a man walking under divine approval from heaven. God delighting in everything he did. I only do what I see the Father doing, he said. He just lived this unadulterated, pure, clean, wonderful life that the Father completely delighted in. Wherever he went, he's got heaven's full smile of approval. Every single thing he does, every word he says. Not a moment when he goes outside of that. Just sheer delight. Just, the, just what a thing. Imagine just to be there, walk, walk, walking with him, getting to know him. A man who just radiates the enjoyment of God. I mean, if ever there was a guy who didn't need to pray, it's him. And yet he seems to pray more than anyone else. Because he just knows, I love, I love the approval of the Father. I love his assessment of me. I love being his and him being mine. I, I'm, he's just intoxicated with God. He boasts of his Father wherever he goes. And wherever he's going, you know, blind eyes seeing, deaf ears hearing. He's just the favor, the approval of God wherever he went. It's absolutely fabulous. He says, after the feeding of the 5,000, he refers to himself saying that the Son of Man will give you food that endures to eternal life. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. <laughs> God approves of this beautiful Son. He is the boast of heaven. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is the one that the Father delights in. Just without equivocation. On the Mount of Transfiguration, there it is. He suddenly shows up. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. It's just beautiful. This is Jesus. Absolutely amazing. But how does it help us that he was so approved of? See, I can see that he's approved of, but then when I think of myself, I think, well, I know I do things that God does not approve of. So how does that benefit me? Even this last week, just think, you think, you know, I lost my temper, and I had to, I had to gather the family together. And I had to say, I'm sorry. I had to say it to all of them. I'm sorry, Daddy shouldn't have spoken like that. that was, I lost my temper, and I went off in a huff. And I kind of felt God's provocation. I think, oh, gosh, well, that's just not why. So I had to go back, and I had to say, I'm sorry. Because God doesn't approve of that. And if God doesn't approve of that, then what hope is there? How can I come here on a Sunday morning and boast about Jesus if God doesn't approve of my sin? It says on a dark day, he poured out all his disapproval on Jesus. On the cross, all God's perfect disapproval for all my stupid sin was spent on him. The approved of one. The one who was completely approved of. 
so difficult. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, for you and me. And all God's disapproval was bent on it. And now because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may be the righteousness of God. I get to switch places with him. I get to come to Father and say, Father, you approve of me. I have Jesus' approval before you. You, brought, you clothed me in your son. Now I come as one approved of. All the sin has been dealt with. All his disapproval is gone. Now I just come to an approving father. It's just stunning. That's what we're invited into. It's not about trying to be good. It's about discovering he approves of you now. So you said you want to not miss the quiet whispers of the wise. I wonder if you missed the quiet whisper in verse 7. When it said, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, it then says why? For God has already approved of what you do. God approves of us in Christ. So all that he gives to, to Jesus, we step into. We get his approval. It's a beautiful and wonderful reality. And so Jesus ends up saying, here's, here's the thing. The, the swap happens, yeah? It's substitutionary atonement, it gets called theologically. He is our substitute. He atones for our sin. We step into his shoes, as it were. We get to enjoy the Father. We get to enjoy fellowship with God. But it's not simply that we're hidden in him and there's a kind of disguise. I remember Bob saying this beautifully, that he started to realize it's not just that Jesus' righteousness kind of hides me so that I come in and it's sort of like, well, you don't really know what I'm like. And now I kind of peek in, and peek from behind Jesus, as it were. But once you step into that, you get adopted into the family of God. So God does delight in you. You, you get to be loved like Jesus was loved. And so he says in John 17, that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, you lot, <laughs> us, have loved them even as you have loved me. If you haven't reflected on that, you must that you've been brought into a position where God loves you with the same love, the same love that he loved Jesus with. You are as approved of now in Christ as Jesus. He's, you've got the approval of heaven. Okay, God approves of you. You get to come to a father and say, thank you, you love me in the same way that you love Jesus. That is glorious, to be as loved as Jesus. Do you think there was ever a time when he prayed and thought, but I don't know if he really listens. Is he really hearing me? He's talking to his father. He is the approved of son of God. And he's invited you to step into that and live in the enjoyment of being approved of, coming to a father saying, Father, you love me. You're for me. You're with me. You care for me. It's just stunning. Let me commend John 17, 23 to you. That's the verse where it says that. You've loved them even as you loved me. You reflect on that. It's sweeter than sin. It's more beautiful than anything else. So here's the whisper to close with as we come to communion. Life is short. This is the message in a nutshell. Life is short and impossible to control. Don't get caught up in being moral. Don't get stuck in sin. Recognize the greatest legacy follows those who know God approves of you in Christ. So enjoy him and enjoy life with all you are. Okay? And we're going to pray. We're going we're gonna to take communion together. And uh, David will lead us in a song. And so... Uh, let me just close in prayer. And as the song is sung, if you uh, follow Jesus, if you know he's your savior, let me encourage you to come forward and take of the bread and the wine at the front right, bread and juice at the front left. And uh, you come take it uh, back to your seat. And I'd actually like to read something to you, so we'll take it together, okay? I'm just going to pray, and then as we start to sing, you can come forward as you feel ready and take the bread and the wine and, and re return to your seat and just hold on to it, okay? But Father, we do just thank you so much for these glorious things. Help us to dare to believe you're this generous. Lord, we don't want in any way to get into any kind of overindulgence in creation in a sinful way, but we do want to indulge in the gifts of God and to celebrate the reality our God is generous. But in all of that, we want mostly to enjoy your loving approval that is now ours in Christ. That our enjoyment of creation would be a genuine act of worship done with, with a sense of great awe and peace and happiness, knowing God smiles on me. He approves of me because Christ is enough. So help us to live in the good of these precious truths, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.